South Africa has approached the International Court of Justice accusing Israel of genocidal acts. What is this case about? Indonesia is set to hold presidential and parliamentary elections in 2024 and these will be historic in many ways. Who are the contenders and what is at stake? This is the Daily Debrief. These are the stories for the day and this is also the final episode for the year. So if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. South Africa has filed a case in the International Court of Justice accusing Israel of genocidal acts. The case filed by South Africa states that Israel's actions are, and I quote, genocidal in character because they are intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial and ethnic group. We go to Abdul for more details on this case. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. A very significant case. Could you first maybe take us through what exactly are the arguments South Africa is presenting? What is in that document? What are the details? What are the claims? And what are the accusations against Israel? Well, Prashant, South Africa has accused Israel of committing genocide in a case filed in the International Court of Justice or the World Court as it is known because it is affiliated to United Nations. Um, and it basically asks it to adjudicate on that. It means once the court sits on it and, uh, and if it, it decides that what is happening inside Gaza for last three months, almost three months, uh, is a genocide or not. If it is, if it rules uh, that way, that it is a genocide, it, it would invite international sanctions against Israel and also would invite uh, actions uh, against the Israeli leadership. Um, uh, the, the case is basically based on the facts of uh, the, uh, the facts that more than 21,000 Palestinians have been killed in the Israel's indiscriminate bombing and ground offensive uh, since October 7, uh, and uh, thousands of others around. 55 to 56,000 Palestinians have been wounded. Most of these Palestinians uh, which are killed and wounded are civilians, mostly children and women. And uh, in basically, uh, uh, basically uh, questions, the, 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 the nature of the overall killing questions, the Israeli claim that it is fighting against uh, Hamas and acting uh, in its self-defense. Well, uh, the international law does not recognize Israel's uh, right to self-defense anyway because it is an occupying power. So uh, that is one thing. The second thing, of course, is it is based on the observations made by uh, different uh, UN experts. In fact, a set of UN experts on November 16 uh, basically opined that what Israel is doing inside uh, uh, occupied Palestinian territory, that is Gaza, amounts to genocide. A second, a third thing, of course, is related to uh, the statements. Uh, you can say that is an evidence to prove that uh, what Israel is doing is basically a, an act of genocide because as per the international law, an act of genocide is intended uh, act with, to eliminate a, a certain set of uh, people, nation, or ethnic group. And uh, if you see uh, uh, various, uh, you, uh, various Israeli leadership uh, from October 7 onwards have given statements in which they have clearly stated that what they are doing is not against one group or uh, uh, one set of people, uh, one group or one organization, uh, but basically against the entire Palestinian population in Gaza. Uh, Israeli Defense Minister has, ha, has called it, had called Palestinians animal. Uh, uh, then Israeli Prime Minister has basically stated it, which, which in, di in different way, words, which basically means that it wants to expel the entire Palestinian population out of the Gaza Strip. And different other leadership uh, uh, from Israel have basically said that they want to eliminate uh, all the Palestinians and they, in fact, they have stated that they are carrying out collective punishment. 
And if you see the way Israeli actions have been taken out, and, and as it is reported in different uh, media, it, it clearly uh, establishes that what Israel is doing is some kind of collective punishment against Palestinians. And if it is a collective punishment, it is uh, 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 with the intention of uh, kind of uh, throwing Palestinians out of Gaza, of course, uh, that would amount to genocide. So basically, collecting all these facts, and collecting the uh, statements made by different experts uh, on internet in international media in last three months, uh, 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 South Africa has moved to uh, in ICJ asking uh, it to take a final call. Right, and South Africa has been one of those countries which from the very beginning has been taking a very powerful stand against Israel's actions since October itself. Could you maybe also take us through some of that? Well, Prashant, uh, South Africa's move comes after uh, a considerable amount of time has lapsed since the war began and since various experts, various human rights groups, some of the countries uh, repeatedly reminded the International Criminal Court of war uh, uh, crimes which Israel has been committing uh, inside Gaza. Uh, it has also, uh, they have also basically raised the issue of uh, violation of different international law, humanitarian law, by Israelis, by uh, targeting civilians, using prohibited substances, um, chemical weapons, um, uh, and against the Palestinian people, uh, targeting uh, health uh, staff, targeting uh, uh, aid workers, targeting hospitals, and so on and so forth. So uh, there has been different complaints and different notices given to the International Criminal Court in the last three months by different organizations raising the issue of a repeated uh, violation of uh, international law and uh, repeated war crimes committed by Israel. And But ICC in particular has failed to take uh, note of it, despite the fact that the, uh, uh, the Chief Prosecutor uh, Karim Khan visited um, uh, the visited Gaza, uh, and despite the fact that he made statements about possible war crimes, it has, it, the ICC has not taken their stance. So, uh, South Africa's move does not come uh, in, uh, a, without any context, one. Uh, South Africa, apart from this, uh, has, uh, has also has a history, long history, of kind of uh, taking uh, the Palestinian issue seriously, and raising it on, on the international fora. It was uh, one of the first countries which recognized the Israel's uh, discriminatory policies against Palestinians, called it apartheid. Uh, of course, coming from its own experience of uh, experiencing apartheid for decades, uh, saying that there is a discriminatory policy, set of policies which was followed, which is followed by the Israeli uh, uh, occupation inside the occupied territories of West Bank and Gaza where there is one set of rules for uh, illegal Israeli settlers and another set of rules for the Palestinians for the same kind of uh, 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 crimes or same kind of uh, uh, behavior or the violations of laws and so on and so forth. Um, that is one, of course. Uh, apart from the fa that, South Africa has also uh, has been very uh, consistent in raising the issue of occupation and demanding a two-state solution. Uh, in fact, ever since uh, the war broke out uh, on October 7, uh, the, uh, uh, South Africa has basically uh, been demanding ceasefire, uh, has been calling uh, for uh, international action against Israeli uh, uh, war crimes. And in fact, the South African legislature passed a resolution demanding expulsion and basically expo uh, expelling the Israeli uh, ambassador from the country, saying that there cannot be normal diplomatic relations with Israel until there is a cessation of hostility in, uh, in Gaza. So, uh, yeah, so the South Africa's uh, uh, action basically has a solid historical background and it basically emerges from its own colonial experiences uh, its own uh, decades of experience uh, uh, of apartheid and occupation. Thank you so much, Abdul, for talking to us.
Presidential and parliamentary elections will be held in Indonesia on February 14th. Incumbent President Joko Widodo, aka Joko V, cannot contest as he has completed two terms. But the political permutations and combinations are quite complex and old foes have turned friends and vice versa. We go to Anish for the details. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, elections, very significant elections in Indonesia. A lot of uh, power brokers, of course, trying to influence the elections. So, let's, could you maybe first give us a, a layout, so to speak, you know, what is the political situation like? Who are the key contenders in this election? So, uh, one of the things that we are you know, need to understand of those who are not very privy to uh, the news in Indonesia very regularly, it is that like the, this current election is going to be very interesting, primarily because of how coalitions have been reworked uh, over the past uh, year or so. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, one of the leading contenders who is seen as a front runner right now, uh, which is Prabowo Subianto, uh, was uh, is being supported by the current uh, incumbent president Joko Widodo. Now, uh, interesting thing is that in the past two presidential elections. Joko, Jokovi and Prabowo were contenders, very, very, you know, uh, stiff contenders. In fact, uh, in both, both the elections were, the election results uh, were contested by Prabowo as having been manipulated or whatever uh, by Joko Widodo and his party at the time, which was the PDIP, uh, led by Sukarno's daughter, uh, Megavati Sukarno Putri. And uh, this reworking of an alliance is something that has been key in the current set of elections. So we have three major candidates right now. Uh, obviously, we have, we have spoken about Prabowo. The PDIP has brought out Ganja, uh, who who has been a long-time uh, leader, but who is seen as the more moderate uh, figure among the three candidates. And then we have uh, Anis Beswadin, who is leading a sort of a different set of uh, opposition parties. Uh, it, well, not really opposition parties because of how things work in Indonesia, uh, because pretty much everybody uh, other than uh, two parties are in the you know pro-government coalition in the parliament. But uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, smaller uh, national parties who have significant clout, who have come together to support Anies' uh, presidential uh, candidacy. Now, uh, in all of these, uh, it, is, it is going to be very... Uh, simplistic to say this one this candidate is more right wing or this candidate is more left wing because pretty much uh, the kind of coalition that has been stitched up by each of the three uh, is very uh, clearly opportunistic we have see, we are seeing uh, islamist parties in pretty much all of them and we are seeing uh, the more supposedly moderate ones uh, taking up uh, alliances and even stand at this point in time during obviously the debates and the election campaigns, a uh, very opportunistic stand on a whole host of issues. And uh, that is uh, something that is uh, quite clearly visible with the recent, uh, you know, anti-Rohingya campaigns that are being uh, led in the Arctic. And that is something that the opposition is trying to uh, take more uh, a political mileage out of. Uh, other than that, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, actual bread and butter issues uh, being com almost nearly sidelined uh, at this current point in time. Uh, the omnibus bill, which has been the biggest political, which has actually created the biggest political uh, movement, nearly an uprising of workers across Indonesia in recent times, uh, is something that is no longer a matter that is being discussed, all three of them, because all the parties in involved have supported the omnibus bill have supported, uh, you know, uh, whittling down labor laws uh, and labor protections, uh, whittling down environmental protections, and uh, they do not want to talk about something that they can be implicated in, obviously. So they have very clearly uh, put that out of the debate as well. And that has been supported by much of the mainstream media as well. So we are looking at a very compromised uh, political uh, uh landscape that is something that Indonesia hasn't seen in a while right now, even though we have seen, like, obviously, the progressives, a very strong left party cannot really exist in Indonesia because of the anti-communist laws. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there has been, at the, at, at the very least, certain issues that were quite uh, significant in previous set of elections, 
uh, which included at times labor laws uh, about national uh, protection of national resources, about protection or uh, protection for you know uh, small uh, workers from all these free trade agreements that exist and so on and so all of these factors do not really uh, come in and figure in the debates right now so this is the kind of situation that we're looking at so february would be a significant issue but what the other thing that we can see is that the reworking of political alliances would mean that we might see a runoff and that is where the real debate would happen right. in the coming months right anish thank you so much for that analysis that's all we have in this final episode of 2023 for this week as well as for the year 2023. We'll be back in 2024 with fresh stories of struggles across the world, of people's movements, of resistance, of geopolitical developments and of the fight against imperialism. So watch out for all of that next year. Also visit our website peoplesdispatch.org, follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button.